Hello, everyone tuning in from all around the world. Welcome to the Cello Camp Investors AMA on what's next in crypto. I'm Rachel Jacob, Program Manager at Cello Camp, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to our special guest joining us today. We have Sochi Kazador from C-Labs, who will be today's moderator, and we welcome our panel, Morgan Beller from NFX, Casey Caruso from Paradigm, and Santiago Royal Santos, who is a DeFi investor. He was just on screen, but he got stuck in an accident, so he will um, try to hop back in shortly. Um, but um, I am really excited for uh, you all to meet our panel today, hear what they have to say about what kinds of projects VCs are looking at now and your insights um, and our insights on fundraising for one's project. Um, before we do get started and I turn it over to Sochi for proper introductions, I'd like to take a moment to speak about Cello Camp and the application process. Um, if any of you here have a blockchain startup that you're building on Cello or plan to build on Cello, now is your time to apply to Cello Camp. We are just one week away from the application deadline, which is on August 24th. So if you take a look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a call to action button and you can apply directly over there or you can head on over to cellocamp.com for more information and apply there. Um, if anyone here today is new to Cello Camp, uh, we welcome you. It's an eight week virtual acceleration and mentorship program that guides blockchain startups in building scalable and sustainable businesses on Cello. It's a great way to launch or scale your projects, build on a mobile first platform with an awesome community that is creating impact all over the world you can receive mentorship from industry leaders like some of our panelists today who are mentors in the program and you can win prizes in CUSD. Teams receive an amazing package of perks, credits and support from our partners, as well as high exposure to investment opportunities and a fast track to solo grants. Since we began Solo Camp in 2020, teams have raised over $15 million, which is pretty sweet. So I encourage you to apply today, if you haven't already, it's a great opportunity, a fantastic learning experience. Um, so head on over uh, to the application and uh, our team will be happy and ready to speak with you. Um, so now back to our program. Um, I will see you at the end of the event and turning it over to Sochi right now. Thank you for joining us. Great. Thanks, Rachel. So my name is Sochi Cazador. I lead ecosystem growth efforts at the Cello Foundation. Um, as Rachel indicated, founders at the heart of the Cello ecosystem. You're the developers, the designers, the dreamers and doers that envision this new open financial system that will help create conditions of prosperity for all. Cello has one of the most diverse ecosystems in crypto with 1900 builders in 113 countries. And we're very excited about Cello Camp as an accelerator that helps nurture founders that are on their journey of taking these bold new ideas and turning them into reality. So I'm thrilled to be here today with Morgan, Santiago, and Casey, who have been mentors at Cello Camp, but also leaders at the intersection of crypto and venture capital. Uh, I'm very excited to welcome them today. So I'd like to turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves and share a little bit about the fund they represent. Casey, you're up. <laughs> Oh, I can start. Hi, everyone. I'm Casey. Um, I'm a partner at Paradigm. Paradigm is an investment firm focused on crypto investments. We were founded in 2018. And I like to describe Paradigm as kind of a mix between investing, yes, but also research. It's kind of um, the bread and butter of what we do. So we really pride ourselves on this deep technical research that we do. Most, if not all of the people on the investing and research team come from a computer science background, including myself. And um, we're a team of nine holistically, including investing in research and work really closely with portfolio companies, both, um, well, I, I guess like throughout the stack. So from DeFi to DeFi to NFTs and everything else that's going on in the space. Are we supposed to give a personal introduction to or just focus on the fun? Well, go for it. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll give it short. Um, but before Paradigm, I actually just recently joined Paradigm. Before that, I was an engineer at Google. I worked on a machine learning research team, um, looking a lot at user behavior and also um, user experience. And 
while at Google, I worked part-time for Bessemer doing frontier tech investing for them. So doing things from quantum to machine learning and also a little bit of crypto as well. And what else? I think that's pretty much it for me. Before that, I worked for the government doing research as well. So really excited to be here and answer all your questions. And yeah. Awesome. Casey, thanks for that. Yeah. Morgan? Yeah. Hi, I'm Morgan Beller. I had a mutual friend's wedding <laughs> this weekend and my voice has, is in Portland, Oregon. So I apologize, but we're going to do what we can today. So I'm a general partner at NFX, an early stage venture fund. NFX stands for Network Effects. Thesis being majority of value in tech has accrued to Network Effects related businesses. It gives us enough of a thing, but it doesn't like it conflict us out of much. But I officially joined last January and about four minutes after I joined, we're a generalist fund. I was like, everything's boring, but crypto. And so I focused 99% of my time on crypto. And we thought about naming the crypto part of the fund something else, but we realized like network effects is actually very relevant for crypto and like the web three world. It's like a nice to have in the web two world and really need to have in this world. So I spend most of my time in crypto. The only other area where I've made investments is in space. Um, I've invested in two rocket companies. And last night a friend was like, Morgan, that's so obnoxious. Like every VC says they invest in rocket ships. And I'm like, no, but like actually rockets. So um, other than that, crypto before this, I was most recently at Facebook, where I helped start the cryptocurrency initiative, which was called Libra and is now called DM. And then in former, former lives, I was at Medium and Andreessen Horowitz. I live in San Francisco. It's not dead. I think that's all I've got. Oh, I'm a proud mentor to Cello Camp, advisor to Cello. Yes. Girl. Awesome. Thanks for that, Morgan. Um, Santiago, are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Uh, apologies for that. I meant to be on video, but um, got stuck in traffic uh, slash accident. But uh, yeah, I'm Santiago. Um, really uh, happy to be here. It's a great panel. Um, I've uh, been a little bit about me. I've been about crypto since 2012. My background's mostly in finance. Was doing investment banking at JP Morgan. Then uh, was investing in open source software. That's what led me to really get it very interested in open source networks, particularly Ethereum. And then um, most recently was um, a partner of Parify, which was perhaps the first DeFi focused fund, maybe the largest um, or grew to the largest. Um, and yeah, you know, really where I tend to focus most of my energy is um, finding, well, especially now, but spending more and more time at this intersection of DeFi, NFTs, the metaverse. I think ultimately everything is a transfer of value and with digital scarcity and just leveraging the distribution of the internet, you're, you're seeing some really interesting network effects and stuff like, you know, Celo, Axie, you know, Alluvium, some of these things that are scaling pretty quickly. And um, so it's really fascinating. Um, I've been, uh, I've had the privilege of being in the Celo camp. Um, I think my claim to fame is out of the three events or out of the three like camps that I've been a part of or four, three out of the four, companies that I've represented one not nothing related to what I've been doing is just pure luck <laughs> so I'm hopeful that maybe I can do you know this fourth one or fifth one I, I can also win but anyways uh here to help and uh you know answer any questions you guys have that's awesome thank you and hope you're staying safe there on the road um so we'll we'll dive right in um so cello as um, you all know, and, and hopefully everybody that's joining the call today is a mobile first, the mobile first blockchain um, that makes financial tools and service services accessible to anyone with a mobile phone. I'd love just to kick it off and to hear from, from, from each of the panelists in terms of what are some of the mobile first projects that you're most excited about seeing built on Celo? And this one's kind um, of- I'll go for it. Nope, you go, you're driving. Table. Oh shoot! Okay. Um, well, well, selfishly, like the the last company that I uh, was um, was a mentor to, I think Paychan, uh, in in Nigeria, took a very mobile first approach. And Nigeria is a country that has a lot of um, um, interest and penetration in like Bitcoin adoption. But mm -hmm. uh, I think their whole idea was like just create like a more streamlined Venmo in Nigeria, and it was really great to see um, that because. I feel like crypto in emerging countries, um, you know, people really kind of need it and use it. 
versus in the US and other more established countries where finance works for the most part. It's not as like must have, but it was really interesting to see and follow their their traction, um, which really speaks to I think Solo's core value prop, which is like let's actually like tailor to a lot of emerging countries and, and usage there, which is critically needed. So that was fun to see. Any thoughts, Morgan, uh, Casey? Sure. This one's kind of a layup, but Valora, the wallet built on top of Celo, I should disclose we're investors. And I just think like order of operations or like Maslow's hierarchy, like a great mobile wallet is what everyone needs first. And I think what they're doing is needed as far as like the countries that they're addressing, the accessibility features, but also that they're going to be a platform and gateway drug to all of these other applications built on the cell environment. So for example, like I'm a big privacy junkie. And we also invested in Poof Cash, which is like tornado for cello. And they're not necessarily mobile first, but via Valora, hopefully the plan is that you'll be able to access their features. And then um, there's some other companies like we're looking at like you know, that Valora is going to be the entry point for Valora users to DeFi NFTs, you know, whatever else gets built. So I'm glad to see like that, that core piece is being built out and being built out well. And Casey, I'm not sure if you remember, but I think you host, uh, oh, the first time that I met you was at an event that you hosted at Cello where you introduced my first wallet um, to uh, a group of crypto newbies in San Francisco. Um, and curious kind of your your thoughts on kind of mobile first and, and crypto. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, the whole entire world kind of like zooming out from crypto is obviously turning to mobile, for, mobile first. And so I think it's really important that as a progressive discipline, we also kind of take take our learnings from the, from the macro view, um, meaning that's very important for us to be mobile first. Um, I do remember that event. That was a great event. Um, I, yeah, I don't want to echo exactly what, or, or kind of just like regurgitate what Morgan said, but obviously the fundamental building blocks are kind of where we're at still in the developing world. And I think that with Valora and these kind of fundamental cardinal pieces coming in place, kind of the, the world is our oyster. But I think like, I don't know, brainstorming outside of that, I, I also like don't think this is gonna be like a copy and paste regime yeah. from what we've seen in the West, but to an extent, we kind of know what we need to build to build to build up like liquidity and build up demand. And I think that there's gonna be a lot of kind of like the fundamentals that we've seen at DeFi in the US be just ported over. And I'm actually really excited for that, even though it seems kind of anticlimactic, just because I think that from there, um, like, I just think we're getting started. And I think that those are like the necessary pieces to have in place. So things like AMMs and all of that, um, like yield generators, all of those kind of pieces are gonna be hopefully created in the solo ecosystem over the next few years. And that'll be really exciting. Yeah, that's a good segue into the next question. I think it sort of bridges what um, Santiago was talking a little bit about earlier as well, is that, you know, over the last year, um, we've seen just an explosion in DeFi. Um, I think what was really interesting is the Defiant recently published an article um, where they said DeFi has a first world problem. Um, in a lot of ways, it's very much accessible only to folks that are kind of in um, you know, more uh, developed countries. Um, and I think there's been a lot of discussion around accessibility in crypto with the gas fees and the complex user experience, things that, you know, we're seeing addressed in, um, in, in the cello ecosystem. But curious kind of thinking in terms of how might we make DeFi more accessible to the everyday user? Yeah, I mean, I'll just start with that. I think the the onboarding fear, I was actually like just reading last night this paper that is making the claim that like all of our actions can be distilled to either seeking pleasure or avoiding pain. And I think it's probably spot on. And I think with DeFi, there's just this like massive risk involved that you're going to lose your capital still. And if you're not native to crypto, you still just feel that. And I, I sometimes forget that, like being so deep in the ecosystem now. So I think like how we can make DeFi more approachable is like when you think about everybody that's going to be onboarding, both from like the developing countries and go, but also from the institutional capital lens, there needs to be like a better way to secure. And if that's a combination between insurance and UX, um, as well as like integration with traditional kind of CFI services. But I think um, making people not scared that that they're like your pool is going to disappear tomorrow is probably the right first step. And education around that as well. Yeah. 
Um, Santiago Morgan, any thoughts on this? Yeah. I can go. I don't want to judge him. Uh, relatedly, I, I mean, I think maybe you don't even call it a urine pool. Like, who knows what a urine pool is? But, like, I think you, there needs to be an optimization function and reduce the number of buttons to push. Like, every time I try some new DeFi something, you're like, oh, my God, I had to push 10 buttons. And I had to wait four hours to just, like, move my money here. So um, there needs to just be a way to move, you know, gross fiat money directly into into said DeFi application for which there are like, you know, Ponto's building on the Celo ecosystem. We're in a company called Ramp, which just lets you put money straight into these applications. So I think that's what you need to like reduce the number of steps and friction, you know, whatever the word is. Um, and then the other is yield pool. You know, there's all these words that we are all familiar with, but if you're new to DeFi, like you have no idea what this stuff is. So I think the other is use cases that look walk and talk mm -hmm. like those cases that people are used to in the traditional world. So we're not an investor in, but we spoke to um, an application called Cresco, which is building on Celo, which is letting people buy stocks um, that are represented um, mm -hmm. in the Celo ecosystem. And that works because like people have like the mental models. They're like, oh, I know what a share of Tesla is. Like, I just want to buy Tesla. This is an easier way to buy Tesla stock. Like, you have no idea what yield farming is. You have no idea what staking is. So yeah, one is like less clicks and two is applications that people are familiar with already yeah even the concept i think of savings has come up as well right um it, you know how do we draw those parallels yeah santiago you were about to jump in yeah i would say like um the just observing user behavior obviously it, it's sort of like it, we're all beta testers people that are using DeFi at the moment like i think uniswap is probably the most popular app and ethereum has like less than 100,000 actives but Axie, on the other hand, is seeing much, much more traction. And so I think what we'll end up seeing is NFTs and, and the metaverse becomes a huge onboarding funnel for people that, you know, I think our relationship with money is changing in a way where, like, you're playing a game, you're earning something in the game that has value. Well, that that is that is like DeFi. Uh, but in many ways, I feel like, um, you know, at that point, you know, the user wants to do something with that value. and. I think insurance is the most important thing. I think any industry in the history of, of time, like without insurance, didn't really take off. And obviously at the moment, the problem with every insurance solution out there in crypto is that it doesn't, it's not op out. Insurance should always be op in. Um, and, and I think like, I'm just waiting for a protocol, like Risk Harbor is trying to do this, but like if there's a cello, whoever's listening, just build an insurance protocol that by default aggregates a lot of things and is op out. You know, meaning like if you're earning like 15, 20 percent yield, if you're skimming like one or two percent uh, of cover, like no one really cares to show the yield net of insurance costs. Because I think like consumer preferences are such that like if you don't buy insurance when you feel the risk, meaning when you're buying a house, when you're buying a car, you're not you're going to forget about it until there's a flood. And unfortunately, most users in the space just realize that they should have done X or Y. And and so I think there's a huge opportunity in insurance. And I think that's what I'm most excited about. So for everyone that's listening, it's building an insurance protocol. I'd love to be matched with you because it's an area that I've been thinking about, kind of obsessive with. Um, so anyways, reach out. You heard it here first on the insurance protocols. Um, I um, wanted to just touch on NFTs and um, and I know you're driving, so I want to be sensitive um, to you being on the road. But um, you recently kind of put a tweet out that I thought was like really interesting about NFTs and the user journey that I think touches on um, touches on some of what you just said. And just to take a step back, so NFTs for those of you that are newer to crypto that are on the call, non fungible tokens, I think made famous earlier in the year with the Beeple sale through Christie's um, that uh, I believe was sixty nine million dollars, if I remember correctly. But what's interesting is like we're starting to see new use cases of NFTs emerge. Um, and this intersection of NFTs and DeFi is really interesting, NFTs and user acquisition as well. Um, so, you know, would love to hear um, maybe some of the projects you, you touched on it a little bit, Santiago, with like gaming and, um, uh, uh, um, and onboarding, but would love to just kind of double click on that with the panel here. Yeah, I think it's well. It's super fascinating what you're seeing with Axie. Like Axie is not a very intuitive game by any stretch of the imagination, but they've sort of pioneered this model, which is called play to earn, which is this idea that, like, you know, especially during COVID, uh, you know, in a similar way that Uber and Airbnb kind of utilize, like, made a new livelihood for a lot of people that could 
become drivers and earn money at their own leisure and rent a part of their home. In a similar manner, like play, play to earn, sorry for the bug, play to earn is like allowing people to play these games, earn money, and then make a living. And this has become hugely popular in places like the Philippines and Venezuela, yeah. in Mexico. And I think like naturally, like to Casey's point, like I feel like a lot of people see that and that's that's a very clear like reason for people to come to crypto. You know, I for, for so many years I've been trying to explain to people, hey, get into Ethereum, get into and they're like or sell it, they're like, why? Like I don't I don't really understand why I need to like you need to transform finance. Like Venmo works okay. Like I use Robinhood. What's the problem? But I think like for so many people, like when, when they see NFTs, um, when they see like, oh, this idea that I can I can I can play a game, like there's just so much more emotional cachet attached to this activity that you know, just just to kind of like get to the point, I feel like if you look at Axie and the number of, of users that they're seeing and the revenue that this game is generating, it's like coming probably going to converge on Fortnite. In, in fact, I think it's going to flip Fortnite, which is perhaps the most popular Web2 game out there in terms of revenue. Um, probably like by the end of this year on a run rate basis, Axie will be generating like more revenue than Fortnite, which is like super impressive, right? And it comes at the right time too, which is you know, more, more like performant blockchains like Celo and, you know, and Layer 2s and Ethereum like are allowing for more users and more activity. So, you know, whereas before in 2017, you had crypto kitties and, you know, you had five kitty kitties breeding and it would have congest all of the Ethereum network group. <laughs> but now like you can credibly like onboard, I don't want to say millions of users, but but kind of close closer to a state where like things work in a more fluid way. And so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just sort of pause there because there's a lot, but I, I like Casey and Morgan step in too. Awesome. Casey, what are your thoughts on um, NFTs and new use cases that are emerging? Um, okay, so yeah, I'm mostly like a huge follower of Axie. I don't want to make this like an Axie yeah. thing. Uh, I do think it's going to be a huge poster child though. If anyone doesn't know, they just crossed $200 million in revenue in just August. We're just halfway through August. Um, that puts them at a $4 billion run, right? Um, but I think like, as we're talking about NFTs, we also need to bring back this like concept of, or, or just like blanket term of tokens. And I think like my mm -hmm. concept of what a token does has actually really shifted and evolved over the last three years. Um, you look at, look at traditional venture and they always say like, I don't understand, like why, why would a token accrue value? Like that is like the, the, the question that everybody or like the narrative that people can't escape. And the reality is like when you're in this space um, long enough, like at least like my view of what it is, it's like, it's this incredible mechanism to distribute value and to enable um, distributed ownership. And that like might seem vague, but that's like insanely powerful. And then, so when you pair that with like this new models, these new models of earning that, economic upside, um, the, the, it's just absolutely insane what we're seeing. And Axie has just done a really incredible job like fine tuning those token economics to make it happen. Um, with like NFT specifically, what I'm most interested in is generative art, probably because my background in machine learning. I think like what we're, we're seeing like two camps emerge. So you're seeing like the iterative NFTs, which are like the crypto punks, which basically mean like, yes, it's programmed, but it's not AI. And then you're seeing like Fedora and like all these, or Fidenza and like all these other kind of actually AI generated. And I think these categories are gonna ossify to like, nobody even understands how big mm -hmm. these are gonna get, like to the fact like traditional artists will probably start using these methods. Um, it's like incredibly scalable. It's like incredibly cool. And I think like that is gonna be this way of like obviously mass attraction of the masses. Um, yeah. And I, I, the other, like, yeah, I, I think in general, like my thesis right now is like the intersection of AI and, and NFTs is like a lot more pertinent than people realize. There's also like a lot of these gaming, gaming things, like, like these new play to earn ones that are integrating these like reinforcement learnings and transfer learning. And um, it, it's going to be 100% like Santiago, Santiago said, our introduction to the metaverse, like without a doubt, I think that's like where I put all my chips right now. That's awesome. Morgan, um, what are your thoughts on N NFTs and what are you seeing at NFX? Yeah. Everyone's so smart going last in this group sucks. Uh, let's see, I'll be fast because everyone like said all the smart things. Um, I just think broadly, like to rewind that like when looking at NFTs, there needs to be like two boxes to check. And one is the art box. Like you need to be like, you want to change your Twitter avatar and it needs to like look sick. And then the second box is there needs to be utility. And I think for the ones that, 
I think have lasting power. You see a lot that make only check the art box and don't check the utility box. So, you know, as I mentioned, Axie, there's like the gaming utility with Zed Run, but you're also seeing like the community utility with like Board Ape and who knows what comes from there. So broadly needs to check those two boxes. And then we'll also just add, you know, a reminder that NFT is a non-fungible token. It can mean many things beyond art also. Yeah. So like there's a company I'm speaking with and they're using NFTs for open source licenses, like, you know, open source software licenses expire every two years. Why does that need to be a piece of paper? So I don't think we, art is like, again, a tangible mental model that we all have today. So it's easy to map to, but I think like broadly NFTs will take over many more. You'll see them come in many more forms. Yeah, yeah I can just add one thing, Go ahead. Uh, which is, I think it's a great point, Morgan, and in case you do on the AI front, like most people, I think NFTs are so powerful because most people think of, oh, it's a picture, right? It's a punk, it's a board ape. Like you can visualize that, whereas, you know, you can't visualize fiat, you can't visualize like an ERC-20 token. But the real value, I think, in all these NFTs uh, is the metadata, which allows you to like piece together, bundle together different NFTs and, and like create utility off of that. And I think the, the real value is in the data. It's not all NFTs are created equally some of that data is not even stored correctly so there's a huge opportunity i think for like um people to focus on, on the metadata layer because generally it as morgan said it, it's just not art right you can essentially be an nft can represent any liquid asset and when you bring more data to an liquid asset and more transparency inherently you create more liquidity and then that creates a flywheel to create more financialization and a bunch of other things on top of that so um that's i think uh, an area that a lot of people are not focusing on which is like the actual metadata behind the set NFT. Yeah, and I think we're just at the infancy to the point. So it's going to be exciting to see um, some of these projects emerge um, uh, that you know are um, are looking at this you know, intersection of NFTs and DeFi's or just kind of more broadly um, in, at the at the metadata, which is awesome. Um, so wanted to kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about um, cross chain. So C Labs recently uh, announced Optics, a gas efficient interoperability standard um, led by um, James Prestwich, the, the, the guru. Um, and it's been really kind of amazing to see the shift towards more cross-chain compatibility. Um, the team that's working uh, on Optics recently coined the term ZAP to describe cross-chain applications. Um, for those of you that are interested, Anna Carroll gave an amazing talk about this at ETHCC. Um, and just would love your thoughts in terms of what you're seeing in terms of cross-chain use cases and applications. Morgan, I see you shaking. You want to go first? No, no, no. <laughs> um, on Cello specifically. Just, I guess, more more broadly, right? I think the the opportunity here is um, is to really look at you know interoperability across chains, right? Yeah. I mean, one is, this is, again, I feel like a layup. Someone will come in after and say something smarter. Um, there, I work for a fund called Network Effects, and Ethereum's got a shit ton of network effects. So, you know, everyone can complain about gas fees and that it's slow, but I frequently use the Yogi Bearism of it's so crowded, no one goes there anymore. And I know we're speaking at a cello event, so we'll get to the point, which is like a lot of the DeFi applications, NFT applications are still being built on Ethereum, despite people complaining about X, Y, and Z. So I think one of like the lowest hanging fruits for cross-chain is going to allow other assets to have access to those applications, like even just getting like Bitcoin over to like the um, Ethereum DeFi world. It's like, you know, with Wrapped, Bitcoin is one of the first case studies but I'm curious to also see if things go vice versa, like the application's now going to other um, chains as well. I'll throw out like just one problem with cross chain that I'm like kind of frustrated by, and I don't know, Morgan and Todd, you might know, but I just like even, you know, swapping from BTC to ETH still is like kind of a pain in the ass and like end up usually using centralized providers. And I think like, maybe this doesn't directly answer your question, but like, I think what we're gonna see and not to call it like another project, but just, you know, like Cosmos, like there are a lot of things happening right now, which are gonna enable these like cross chain communications. And I think that the immediate need, at least like from my point of view is to have, um, yeah, be able to, to trade assets that, that aren't on the same chain. Like, and that's like, it's funny that it's 2021 and we're still having this kind of problem, but I would like that solved. Yeah. 
check out Optics. I think there's some great work that the team is working on specifically to, to solve um, uh, the token swaps with the token bridges. Yeah. Okay, I will. Yeah. Santiago, any thoughts on Zaps? Yeah. Yeah, I was get, I mean, those are all great points. I think uh, Thor chain, chain play, there's a few companies that are like trying to do this, but haven't, um, you know, cracked the nut, I guess. But like, I think uh, one other, just to add something else, um, is this idea of um, like providing, well, like for bridges, I think are super interesting more so from a, how do you get users into Celo? Um, and so like, if you look at Solana, you look at Terra, they've all had like in Binance Smart Chain, um, like they all have different variations of bridges. The smartest bridge that I've seen is one which doesn't require, like I think Matic has like a really ingenious solution, which essentially what it does is it doesn't require the user to do anything other than like it has a faucet and it immediately gives the user gas essentially to pay for transactions. So you don't like, you know, I think like for, for, from seller's perspective, okay, you're building an AMM, you're building a money market, you're building X or Y, an NFT, uh, you know, game or something in, in Celo. Well, there's all these different users in, in these clusters, right? In Solana, Terra, you name it, Cosmos. How do you make that super easy where the user doesn't even need to think about, to Morgan's point, just one click of a button. He doesn't need to even think about yeah. gas. It's like all set up for you. And so this is like this is like how Airbnb beat Craigslist because they just scraped the shit out of it um, and, and then just added a nice pretty picture on top of that. And just lo and behold, you have Airbnb. And so like, I think like that, that kind of, growth hacking would go a long way for, for your project if you're in solo because it is kind of a still an uphill battle to Morgan's point. Like most people continue to live and think in Ethereum land, but that's not to say that they can't migrate over for certain use cases, especially as kind of Binance Smart Chain kind of showed you, like people just go where the yield is, just got to make it easy for them. So I think to that end, I think a, a really smooth bridge would go a long way uh, to get more users into your app. Yeah, I posted for those of you that are interested in following along on this topic, um, you can read more about optics. There's a medium channel that was um, produced and a lot of what we're talking about today with the faucets, um, feeless onboarding and just kind of smooth transactions definitely is in the work. So I encourage you guys to check it out. And I'm going to reach out to you, Santiago and Casey and Morgan afterwards to give you, make sure you guys are the first on our list to get a demo of this. Yeah. Um, one, um, I wanted to kind of shift gears um, a little bit and talk about adoption. So um, the Celo ecosystem is is quite global. I mentioned earlier in the talk, um, you know, we recently passed um, uh, um, 1,900 builders and 113 countries, but also 1 million addresses, right? And we're starting to see signs just across the industry of global adoption. So. Yesterday, um, TikTok, annou TikTok announced the integration with Audius um, as an, an example. And I, I, I think we're starting to kind of see more of these trends that are helping bring crypto mainstream and would love you know, thoughts um, from, from, from you, the panelists, in terms of what do you think are kind of some of the other ways um, that we'll see crypto kind of become more mainstream? I don't know if this was just for me, but you 100% cut out at the end. So I'll, I, I heard like the whole setting up, but I don't actually know the exact question. Did you get that, Morgan? Or should I repeat it? Yeah, I got it, but you can repeat it for Casey. <laughs> okay. Um, so Casey, the question was really um, just on some of the trends uh, that we're seeing kind of bring crypto to more mainstream adoption. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I feel like we, we kind of, we, we may have mentioned this before so sorry if you know this should have been its own kind yeah. of question but um yeah the the elephant in the room is gaming for sure um i don't know if anyone's read matthew ball's essay on, on why gaming is going to become pervasive but it's a fantastic piece and totally worth reading um but yeah i i think that that's that's probably bringing in the most people right now the question the question becomes like, how sticky are these users and how loyal are they to the space? But NFT and gaming are absolutely the two um, most prominent vehicles right now, in my opinion. Well, what do you think, I guess, maybe just to kind of, because um, we did talk a little bit about gaming earlier, but maybe just to focus this a bit more. So we're seeing kind of this um, movement towards social, right? And so Abby just announced kind of this movement towards social. I think this, you know, TikTok and Audius um, integration is, is interesting because it's kind of in that vein. Uh, Twitter just announced the hire of, I think, Jay Gerber to kind of lead um, social uh, crypto for the social platform. And so 
kind of maybe maybe just to kind of fine tune the question here, you know, what are thoughts and kind of like so this intersection with social, right? And what's and what's next specifically in crypto? Yeah. I'm still recovering from Facebook, so I guess I can. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I tried to do that for four years. Here we are. But I so but all in all seriousness, I think there's two ways that this can and will happen. One is top down. So people with existing distribution platforms will add support for crypto and we'll see what happens. And then there's bottoms up, which is there's these new applications that no one's thought of yet, i.e. Axie. We should make Axie a drinking game every time we say it, um, <laughs> where it's like, OK, taking off bottoms up. And as mentioned, I was at Facebook and I have overcorrected now and gone to a seed fund because having seen um, a big company, you're like, OK, I'm actually rooting for the bottoms up adoption. And the reason why is I think to do top down adoption correctly you need to give users a product that they need and want versus just like shove Bitcoin and Ethereum in there. So, I mean, PayPal added support to buy Bitcoin and Ethereum for 600 million people. Like, obviously a great thing. I'm not poo-pooing it, but there wasn't necessarily any other like crypto native part of the experience that you can't even send it. You, have to, you can only buy and sell and hold. Same with Robinhood. Um, so, but again, not poo-pooing it. I think that's great. But I think the things that will really take off as evidenced with Axie, as we're seeing with Solo, are applications that it's like not crypto for crypto's sake. It's like this is some this is something unique that users could not do in another world, whether it's like yeah, even just like what Valor offers or Axie or NFTs or whatever. Um, that this is the only way to do it and the user experience is easy enough and therefore it's gonna take off. So I'm betting on the bottom of that stuff. Um, yeah. Not that I don't think, I mean, TikTok, that's great. I'm not, yeah, that's great. But I think the things that will really, really take off are the things we probably haven't seen yet. Also like the decentralized component, right? Yeah. With Ave, I think it's like it's really interesting. Um, and sorry, Santiago, you were about to comment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just going to add, like, I think, um, well, like NFTs have different shades and like, yeah, gaming is, is huge. Um, but I think social tokens, it's not my area of expertise, but I, I have talked to a few artists that are, you know trying to connect more directly with their audiences um so say you go to a concert you get issued an nft um and you've been following them since the early days you get an nft and so you get part maybe royalties and so this this like um social tokens um i mean there are different variations of, of social tokens but i think generally I, I don't think any artist in today's world is looking what's happening in nfts and saying oh my God, how can I somehow use this to connect with my audience, to get better data and to essentially cut out the middleman? Because I mean, these, these, these deals with these record labels are just absolutely terrible for the artist. And that's always been obviously a big thing in crypto, which sometimes is really fluffy, which is, oh, let's cut out the middleman. But okay, I mean, I think like in principle, it sounds great. In practice, it could be really hard if you don't have distribution and if, you know, ultimately it's not going to go anywhere right and so artists have historically sacrificed you know a big part of their earnings to get with record labels but i think in a very similar way like youtube empowered a bunch of creators uh i think we're at a point where incredibly like the usage of nfts as vehicles to connect with audiences and get in your fan base and get really really high quality high fidelity data to then use do interesting stuff with that because, you know, Apple, Facebook, Spotify, like Spotify uh, Snapchat, they don't really give you this data as, as, as far as I can tell. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think now with NFTs, like NFTs are essentially the cookies of Web3. And so you can do some really interesting stuff with that. And so I think artists, uh, I, I'm, I'm excited to see that. Like, uh, it's not just gaming, it's music. It's, you know, it's 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 uh, any, you know, writing, like there's interesting stuff in Mirror and all this stuff. So, so I, I think, um, yeah, I, I'd pay attention to that. Uh, it seems far-fetched, but uh, I think we're closer uh, than perhaps I would have thought like six months ago. Yeah, like this promise of like data sovereignty as well, right? Which I think is really key for creators um, yeah, and for that, users, that I think, in great. general. Yeah. Casey, your thoughts on this, yeah. Morgan? I, I I honestly think Tanya did a great job covering it. Nothing's coming to mind mm -hmm. to... I'll this with, but I'll think as Morgan goes. 
or oh, no, I ago. spoke my piece on this on this question, I think. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's um, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about we've got um, uh, a little um, uh, over 10 minutes left and wanted just to kind of talk about, um, you know, founders more um, more specifically. And so what do you look for in, um, in a founder and a project that is um, pitching to you? Uh, and, and what are some of the tips that you might give um, to some of the founders on the call? that are um, looking at bringing these, their projects, um, uh, you know, to investors for, for, for funding, yeah. Yeah, I think last year, I kind of like walked through a framework for this, which I don't have at my disposal at this moment, it's on a different computer, but for like uh, advice for founders, or I feel like at least like what I'm looking for, um, I mean, there's a lot of things like founder product fit, we're all in a good market as I've kind of invested both inside and outside crypto. I am the biggest believer now that market is, I don't want to say everything, but like it is the ocean you live in. And if the tide's not moving up, it's going to be really hard to fight that. So like everybody in this room is really um, fortunate to be, have interest, be interested in an industry that's so both like lucrative, of course, but also just like the, the community behind this is just absolutely un, unmatched. Um, but so like besides the market, you know, going after a problem that you feel like you're uniquely suited for. Um, and then the, the trait that I want to like narrow in on or hone in on today is probably thoughtfulness. It's something that's like been top of mind for mm -hmm. me. And it's not even this idea of like having all the answers. It's having like having thought through all the questions because like nobody has the answers. We don't have the answers. We don't know. A lot of this world is trial and error. And there's just so many outcomes and things. Thankfully, as like sentient beings, we can like project and kind of like suppose what will happen in these circumstances, but until you try it, you really don't know. Um, but I feel like this, like there is this differentiating factor between like these all-star founders and like good and great. And it is like this ability to just like be like a decision tree and think through all the outcomes, even if you don't understand the probability behind them. Um, there's like so much more, but I don't want to also like steal too much air time. So I'll pause there. <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts on this. I've done a lot of mapping. <laughs> Morgan from NFX, um, what are some of the tips that you would impart on the founders? Yeah. Now I'm just stressed that I have not done any mappings. <laughs> I just kind of making it up. <laughs> um, so I, mean, I'm, I do seed and pre-seed investing. So it's like really all about the founder. Like my corny analogy is seed invest. Like every seed company is a really complicated equation with no fixed variables. Like the market's going to change. The idea is going to change. The name's going to change. But hopefully the only fixed variable is the founder. So it's a lot of pressure, guys and women. Um, so the two, the one question I ask every time, I guess is two questions, is what's your six month plan and what's your take over the world plan? And I use it as a proxy for like sobriety and insaneness. And like, so like for the six month plan, like are you sober enough to like be able to like think through like tangible plans of like what steps are needed to take in the next six months, to like accomplish some tangible thing and then take over the world plan. Are you delusional enough to like be out of your mind. So in a good way. So that's like what you kind of look for, like the dreamer and the doer. That's what I look for. I don't know if it's right. Yeah. I mean, those are all like really good things. The only thing I would perhaps add is if I already like gun to my head and just ask or focus on one thing is um, it's like, what's the unique insight of a founder? Cause you know, like everyone has ideas and like this space is no shortage of ambitious founders that just, you know, crypto attracts people that are smart because it's an industry that has a lot of asymmetry, has a lot of unsolved problems. And cryptography is generally still hard and it's nascent. But I guess like, you know, I'd like to see like, why is this, found, like, so like, what's the unique insight of the founder? Uh, because if I don't see that, then it's kind of really hard for me to believe that they're going to like outcompete all the other people um, and be thinking to Casey's point, thought like, the thoughtfulness it sort of speaks to the thoughtfulness uh and and how they thought about the world and if they think in binary terms or they think probabilistically and so like yeah I, I, it's it's hard to like describe okay what is that unique insight but it's you know peter thiel sometimes describe it as like okay what is it that you believe in that others don't um and like vitalik had this idea of a general like like supercomputer that would express more logic than Bitcoin. And I guess other people were thinking about that. It was just the Vitalik, I think, just was wired differently. You could have 
you felt it in his voice. You felt it in how he was able to process information and just like be this, literally his brain is a supercomputer. So uh, I don't know, but like, I feel like I always ask that question. I'm always intrigued by the answer that I get. Um, and sometimes a founder like I am doing now is rambling because they can't crystallize their thoughts pretty well. And so it, it's, it's, I appreciate it somewhat amorphous, but like, I think really good founders can, when I ask this question, they almost inherently like cut me off, like cut me off, like before I finish the sentence, like, okay, here's what I've been thinking about. And I'm obsessed about it. And I was like, all right, okay, well, shit. Yeah, I'll take all my money. That's, that's awesome. Um, just circling back to something Casey said as we wrap up, um, I think that, um, and Chris Dixon had this uh, thread on Twitter recently that I think, you know, I'll just leave a lot of you with. And it, it is that, you know, we are really on the frontier. Right. And if we think back to like moments of where we've seen interruption and in technology, you know, we've wondered what it has been like to be there. I think we're all there. Um, and so would encourage you all, um, you know, just to work with each other. I think we're starting to see, you know, the power of this industry coming together um, and want to thank each of the each of the panelists for joining us this morning um, and uh, afternoon, uh, Santiago from the car as well. Um, and you made it through without uh, another accident, so which is great. I'm um, sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. I'm terrible. I, I um, promise to go on video next time. No, no, it's all good. Yeah, it was all good. And if you haven't, please follow um, our um, our panelists on Twitter. They have amazing things to say, and definitely encourage you um, um, to follow along. Um, just a couple of announcements before I turn it over to, to Rachel. Um, so um, we have this Thursday Connecto, which is a solo community call. Really encourage each of you um, to attend. And we're gonna be announcing the Cello Community Builder Award where one builder will receive 1,000 Cello. Um, so be sure to nominate someone by 5 p.m. today uh, and we'll kind of post the, the links here for, for each of you. Um, and again, thank you to Casey, Santiago, and Morgan for joining us. It's been awesome as always. Uh, and we'll pass it over to you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Sochi, Casey, Morgan, and Santiago. Um, this was an incredible talk. This is really awesome. Um, we, we did have a couple. We do have five more minutes. And we have some questions in the Ask a Question tab. So. Um, oh. Perfect. Why don't we, you know, go with the first one here? Um, what are the first real-world use cases you think will be adopted while leveraging mobile first? I guess we can't say gaming, right? We already said. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody want to take this one? The question is, what will be the first? Um, First real world use cases you think will be adopted while leveraging mobile first? Yeah, I, I think I think it is gaming. I don't, we're already seeing it. Um, I don't know, I think a use case, there, it, it, it's gonna be like, um, in my opinion, it's just gonna be like these new forms of, of earning. So like jobs just like in not traditional sense, like we can already see that COVID's really deconstructed our views of like a nine to five, that deconstruction is just gonna continue to, to deteriorate. And I think that from there, there's like gonna be like, like crypto is gonna bring on the new labor force. It's gonna be like something totally different, like kind of like Upwork, but on steroids um, with a lot more integration and, and like ease of use and connection. Um, and I think that's like coming faster than people all right, awesome. Let's take another question. Um, what's next in the creator's economy? Like big cloud collab land, what kinds of projects, topics do you see potential in? Yeah, I think it's the idea of the distributed work, um, but in mm. kind of like Upwork um, or Fiverr, there's some of these marketplaces that are still kind of fragmented and localized because of I mean, I guess you could like hire people anywhere in the world, but payment continues to be somewhat of an issue. But I think uh, we're seeing interesting activity in DAOs. I'm super bullish DAOs as more streamlined mechanisms to empower and coordinate talent and, 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 and you know, create new employment opportunities. Um, open source communities 
have proven to be scaled pretty quickly, like Linux, and you're seeing it in Ethereum, and just generally Web3. So I think more and more people, it's, and it's not just developers, I think just people from all, I mean, crypto is very multidisciplinary. So DAOs, I would pay attention to DAOs and the, uh, I think that's uh, going to probably create a lot of interest. Uh, and, you know, especially at this intersection of like AI, uh, which unfortunately displaces a lot of like manual labor and, you know, uh, I'm not a Luddite. And so I think generally speaking, like DAOs and Web3 is going to create a new, interesting ways of like employment opportunities. And uh, I think, you know, you can imagine yourself getting pinged by a particular DAO if you have a particular area of expertise and like you would just immediately like do the job, get paid, there's verifiers, you get paid a native token and you know, everyone's happy. Okay, awesome. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to contribute to this question? Okay, great. So I think we're we're at time. Um, thank you, everyone, to our audience for tuning in today um, and for participating, and to our panel um, for your insights um, into um, into uh, the crypto space. And um, this was this was a fantastic conversation. And I am going to rewatch this afterwards because I think there's a lot of great material that, that we learned today. And to everyone listening in, you can rewatch this following the event. Um, and just a quick reminder that um, the application deadline for Cell Camp is August 24th. So one week away, we encourage you to apply. I already see people saying that they're applying in the chat after this conversation. Yeah. So I'm excited to see the products that you're building. Um, and again, thank you to our panel. Um, we hope to see you all again. Um, until next time, um, everyone have a great day. So thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much Bye. guys. Take care. Bye. Thank you.